welcome to What the Hell. Today we're going to talk with Kirk. Sch- it's Schwab, right? Or Schwab? Schwab, correct. Schwab. Okay, we're talking with uh, Kirk Schwab. He is a candidate for the governor of Texas. And uh, first of all, we'll go ahead and with Johnny with the uh, a couple of questions, and we will just get a get a basis of uh, what you're trying to do uh, for Texas. All right, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna paint you into a corner. I'm not gonna give you any of these gotcha questions. I'm not gonna toss you any saw. So- I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tee up a softball question for you either. Um, All right. Well, may, maybe maybe later, like at the end, but you know we'll figure it out. Um, was taking a look at your website to kind of get a feel for some of your stances on the issues, um, but as it related to border security, I kind of wanted to get your take on what you propose to do as far as helping to shore up our southern border you know first of all i have to tell you that uh, uh, i think it's an embarrassment to have our current governor ask for donations and ask for help from other states we have the resources here um you know the other thing is is why are we uh arresting people and putting them in jail because guess who's paying the bill Texans right. will eventually be paying the bill. So, you know, what I propose to, to try and do, what I'd like to do, is I think we need to set our foot down. I think we need to to mean business and not just say, oh, you're going to jail. Well, they get a roof over their head and they get three square meals a day. So <clears throat> I think we need to come down, and if it's possible, I think we need to come down and say, look, anybody that crosses the border illegally – or with any type of drugs, or with any weapons. Uh, I think we need to, to, call me crazy, but I think we need to uh, log them as a terrorist. Because anybody wants to come into our country illegally, somehow, some way, they will do us harm. And I think if we come out with that, I think people will probably change their mind. Now, with that being said, I have no issue with our government reaching out to the different countries of the people that are trying to cross the border and seeing what their issues are. You know, it might be something as simple as putting lights in the streets, uh, maybe securing a little bit uh, better safety uh, factors within their cities, but something. Um, And I think if we would show initiative on doing that, I think things would change. Absolutely. Um, just to kind of follow on to that border security question, um, we've got a lot of private citizens, a lot of, you know, a lot of Texans that have a lot of ranch land, a lot of farmland along that border. Um, would you consider expanding the, uh, the the castle law here in Texas to help those private citizens protect their private property? Oh, absolutely. You know, our farmers are a big uh, a resource and, and a, a piece of our communities, um, and we need to help protect them as much as possible. I don't care what we do, uh, because if it gets past the farmland, then it's just going to keep migrating into Texas, and, and we need to stop that. What about actual uh, – because we used to have something called Ranch Rescue. Uh, I think it was like uh, 2002 to 2006, which we actually had like this uh, small uh, amount of people that were armed and they were protecting the ranch. Uh, would it be uh, more efficient to give a little bit of uh, uh, subsidi- uh, subsidiaries to these ranchers to offset something like that on their own land? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, hear you say that 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 me being dyslexic and trying to talk half the time, I I can't even say certain words, so it's really hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the word he was going for, I think, was subsidies. Yeah, probably. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, you know, I, I think uh, um, our federal obviously not interested in putting our land. Uh, especially Texas. You know, Texas should be the number one state. And if you've seen recently, uh, we just came out on some poll that Texas is not the number, you know, we're not the kindest state anymore. Uh, We need to change that. And I think people are getting angry because we're we're so focused on hating the people that are coming across illegally. So if we change our tune and start stepping things up, you know, I'd like to bring that back. I'd like to bring Texas 
Texas back is a friend of the state. So um, it, if the government is not going to protect our land, uh, each individual down on the border has every right to do so. And we need to stand behind those people. Yeah, and um, I, I I saw um, that coming up on September 1st, Governor Abbott signed a law that's going to become effective on the 1st of September. Uh, it's a constitutional carry law. Huh? Um, now, part of that, there were some, uh, some uh, parts of that House bill it uh things and i i i everything that i've seen from this so far I'm, i i like um uh, it specifically as it relates to things like uh authorizes constitutional carry in texas meaning law-abiding texans can legally carry a handgun without a license to carry and that's from uh from the schaefer schwarzner portion of the house bill 1927 uh there was also something in here about silencers which Suppressors. 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 Know, but right. the, the verbiage in here says silencers. And I, I know and you know. That's just like it's not a clip, it's a magazine. Yeah. Um House Bill 957, the Oliverson and Springer portion of it, it repeals criminal offense of possessing, manufacturing, transporting, or repairing a firearm suppressor. Um, it also ensures that any firearm suppressor manufactured within the state of Texas and remains here will not be subject to federal law or federal regulation. Um, my question about this, this, uh, this law and the different parts of it is with your stance on the second amendment, according to your website, you're very pro second amendment. Yes. So is this something that, I mean, obviously you're going to stand behind and, and it's not something that you're going to, you know, cause I know the executive order is just a, it's a, it's a very popular tool, but, uh, you know, as far as like any, any shortcomings that the law may have. Once it once it gets here and, and it starts being put into practice and it's being observed, um, we, we may start seeing some like loopholes within the law kind of a thing. If you were to be elected governor, would that be something that you would work with the state legislature to fix? Or would you, you know, how would you address those? Well, I, you know, I think all the pieces that go along with any gun and uh and being allowed to carry as long as it's manufactured in texas um you know i'm all for that mm -hmm. um i i don't think anybody should have any kind of legal tag uh weighing them down to, to do that um and i and i think as as you probably know uh one of my um uh, uh points on my format is texas owned businesses right. um so we need to push that. And as long as we stand behind Texas owned businesses, that would absolutely be a part of, of standing, standing behind and making sure uh, that continues to flow. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought up the point of Texas owned businesses, because this kind of follows in or kind of runs into my next question is, would you be, or would you incentivize or what kind of incentives would you be willing to offer gun and man ammunition manufacturers to locate or relocate to the state of Texas? You know, uh, somebody brought that up uh, a while back, but not with the uh, gun manufacturers, but with, say, Facebook and Google and, you know, all those big corporations. Um, I want to attract those businesses here. I want to be able to hire uh, Texans and create more jobs with those. Um, however, by giving them for lack of better words, free reign to move here and no taxes. I think that's wrong. You know, we need to create income for Texas. Now, uh, I think if we do that, we can help with the, the personal property taxes from the employees that, that either move here, or get hired on here, or, you know, whatever the case is, because we need to, to lower personal property tax and, or put a cap on it. We can't get rid of it. I mean, that's just, I would like to. I'm a 70% disabled veteran. I'd love to get rid of it. But, um, you know, that's part of our income. And uh, But I think we need to tag the big businesses that want to move here. I think we need to get their tax money. Well, yeah. the thing about that, though, it's like uh, what they did in Georgia. Georgia 
the reason why most of the movies are actually being made in Georgia is because each movie gets a 30% tax break for that uh, for them to actual film. And Right, but now you're talking about a different subject. Yeah. So I uh, that would be the mind. same incentive though. You move well, your business here and well, you no. get like uh, a like a 20% tax break for so many years on something you know, like they, that. When when you film here, that's only a short time uh, uh, one time deal because your uh, your meetings for the local uh, restaurants and so forth. I have a friend of mine who's the president of Hip Films, um, who keeps me apprised and all that. And also, actor Patrick Kilpatrick, uh, Kilpatrick is a good friend of mine. Um, so those are those are uh, one and dones. Um, now, with the corporate world, if they want to move their entire corporation here, then maybe we set up. Uh, uh, a stepping stone in taxes. You know, you don't pay so much for the first five years and you bump it up to the next. The t- it off at 15 years. Either your That's connection or our connection. Can you go ahead and repeat that because the connection is kind of yeah, bad they, right uh, now. Yeah, we it, lost it, all of that. Yeah, it went in and out. So yeah, just like just the last couple of couple of things that you touched on there. Yeah, um, uh, bringing them in well, permanently as a as a corporation, it started to break gotcha. up from there. Uh, right. If, if, I think if we if the uh, big companies want to move here, bring their corporate headquarters here, I think we need to l- utilize their taxes. Whether we put them on a stepping stone. Uh, you know, one to five years, they pay X amount of percent, uh, five to 10 years, they pay a higher percent and so on. And we cap it out at 15 or 20 years. But uh, but we need to to rely on uh, the corporate world's taxes. And how would you actually stop on something that's actually new for police officers has been happening recently is the uh, sovereignty uh, people. To where basically what it is, is uh, they say they're part of a sovereign nation within our nation, and they don't have to obey our laws. Look, you're, you're in America. You're in the United States of America. Uh, when you step in and you come through customs, you have to abide by our laws. If you're in Texas and the highway speed limit is 70 miles an hour and you're doing 90, you're getting a ticket. Well, what's really funny uh, about that, though, it's not other nations saying that. It's actually people that are born and bred in the United States. And what it is, uh, the cops are having problems with it only because, say that you get somebody, he, uh, you arrest him. He's saying he has sovereignty and everything like that. He bogs up the court system and everything. What's well, not the problem with that? It, it's still a problem. But the problem is him saying it while he's getting arrested, and you have Joe Schmo over there thinking, oh, he might have a point. I'm going to try this next, and it escalates after that. Yeah, I, 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 I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm not too familiar with that. Um, it, it's, it's fairly new. Uh, like, it's been happening a lot in uh, – Washington, that whole Seattle thing when they had when Seattle had that whole oh. block, that was an attempt to uh, sovereignty little uh, area, and that's what. Yeah, and it's just yeah, escalating well, a little bit more nowadays. I mean, well, look at Washington State. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, that's I know source. <laughs> but here in Texas, you know, if you're in Texas, you abide by the Texas laws, cut and dry. Um, I don't care about any sovereignty you know, whatever you're in Texas, you abide by Texas laws, just like everybody else has to. Okay. Now I know that we came dangerously close to having a state income tax uh, put on us. And it's just because of the, you know, the size and the expenditures every month that the state, uh, the state government has to, you know, has to put out. Um, And for me, at least, I know this may be oversimplifying the issue, 
But for me, I think one of the quickest ways to reduce the amount of money that the government spends is to reduce the size of the welfare rolls. So what, what incentives would, or, you know, or, or how would you address incentivizing people to come off of the welfare rolls? You know, I've been seeing this post on Facebook several times. It says, instead of paying $300 a week to not work, how about paying $300 week for them to work? Uh, imagine how quickly our unemployment rate would, uh, would drop with that. Right. Um, it's a shame that I've gone into several establishments where I see um, uh, signs, you know, please be patient, we're short-staffed, uh, you know, thanks for your time, you know, whatever the case is. Um, I've never seen that in my life. I think it's crazy. Um, I, I think the federal government is hurting us by doing that, you know, and I keep seeing uh, news clips of a fourth stimulus check possibly going, uh, coming out, and I, that's crazy. You know, we need to get people back to work. We need to force them back to work uh, and get people off of uh, uh, relying uh, on the on the government. Yeah. Yeah. And see, because for me, at least, you know, uh, I say identified and I don't want to be like I identify as an Apache helicopter or anything like that, but um Whenever people ask me what my political affiliation is, I don't tell them that I'm Republican or, or, or Democrat. I'm, I'm a Reagan conservative. And there you go. So, you know, I believe in certain edicts that, that we must abide by, and that includes a small but limited government. We need to trust but verify. We need to have our peace through strength. And, and just like Ronald Reagan stated when he was leaving the White House on his farewell, uh, farewell address, America needs to be that shining city on the hill. And, well, people come here, obviously, uh, from all over the world, whether it's legally or illegally. I mean, if, if our country was that bad, they, you know, they wouldn't be coming here. But, um, you know, I, I do think that the fact that we've got so many people on the welfare rolls that, I mean, it, it, it goes all the way back. For me, it goes all the way back to the 60s when johnson president johnson and the democrats passed the fair deal act and when they created this this underclass of of voters by 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 enabling that womb to tomb you know government dependency you know culture and that's something for me as not only a citizen of the state of texas but as a voter you know i want to see that reduced you know i want to see i want to see these people come off of the welfare rolls i want to see them become self-sufficient because uh, among other things that makes our country as great as it is, is the fact that we're able to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. And welfare, when it was originally created, was never intended to be a handout. It was designed to be a hand, uh, or a hand up. And, sure. and it was supposed to be a hand up that was to be paid back. Um, and as it stands now, we're on our second or third generation of welfare recipients and they're not having to pay a single dime of that money back. Right. So, you know, you know, um, I, you know I, and I'll, I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that, you know, even though that the government and the state has ended, um, you know, this pandemic uh, money. Now, I have a friend who they drive for Lyft and they don't wear a mask. They, they can't wear a mask. And Lyft is still requiring every the drivers to wear a mask. So, you know, it, I think it needs to depend on the situation. Uh, um, you know, if a guy's relying on driving Lyft as his job, then, um, you know, he's kind of. Uh, so I think it depends on the way, for the most part, uh, we need to get uh, people, especially Texans, back to work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, bottom line for me, yes, the, the Texans need to be put back to work. Uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm addressing, you know, it, it's the, I want to avoid the word slovenly, but it, that's, that's the mentality that's been adopted, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're, they, they, they have no incentives to go back to work. Now, these, these, these individuals like your friend who drive for Lyft and, you know, that's what they do for a living. I mean, at least at that point, they're doing something to try to get back into the workforce, whether they're, you know, uh, classifying themselves as self-employed or an independent contractor or whatever it is that that Lyft right. or Uber does. 
that's fine. But you know, it's it's more of the people who being on welfare is their job. And right. you know, and it's those individuals that that and at some point I, I know that they're gonna have to have some kind of rehabilitation, some kind of vocational training. And and those are the incentives that I'm looking for. It's like, are we gonna create I know that we've got the workforce commission throughout the, you know, the various counties within our state, but those programs, I think they're just, they're, they're kind of there right now as more of a, I mean, I think that they're, you know, they, they just kind of take up space. They, they really don't have any power to them. And I'm not talking power as far as like authoritative rule. I'm I'm talking about, they, they don't have a lot of punch. You know, the, the, they're, they're, the, the people that are going to the Workforce Commission are not being held to a standard. You know, it's like, you, you know, you. Right. Well, I will tell this you this. I, I think if we're going to look at people, <laughs> if we're going to look at people on getting them back to work, um, as you know, uh, I'm an Air Force combat veteran. Right. Um, one, of my, one of my major items is veterans. And I think. Um, that would be my first step is to get veterans who can go back to work, back to work um, and, and help as much as possible. They are afraid to go back to work because maybe they have certain, certain issues. Maybe, you know, I know it sounds funny, to say, but, you know, maybe or back to the work. Um, maybe they need to have multiple breaks within an hour and, and some things that an employer, some employers may not like. But we need to help people regardless get back to work and uh, need to do it fast because, you know, come July 26th, uh, that's it. I mean, people, you're going to see a lot more uh, uh, probably foreclosures. You're going to see a lot more evictions um, and so far i have not seen anything done for these people except extend the date uh to keep people from being evicted or, or foreclosed on all right all right so we're gonna we're gonna transition from that subject um something with a little bit more of uh, uh well, i got a question yeah go another one uh on, on certain alternative talking about of uh helping me out veterans and everything like that, especially combat veterans that have PTSD. Now, would you be uh, into going into a different alternate of uh, medical uh, ways to actually uh, help these people out, such as uh, using DMT, which is basically a hallucinogen, to actually uh, stop? Because a lot of actual people that have actually gone to a ayahuasca uh, event where they they're in a secure area they're taken care of they're making sure nothing goes really wrong uh when they do their uh hallucinogens uh to the point to where uh they can go through it they can get past it and it helps them out uh horrendously i'm mean, not horrendously but uh tremendously tremendously yeah where it's not good for me <laughs> right but <laughs> some states actually approve it but texas has not approved something like that as of yet would you be willing to go through that and i mean it really does i mean there's only like one instance uh, but he kept on falling off the wagon and everything so he wasn't really trying to help himself and he ended up committing suicide but there's actual people out there that's actually tried this and it's really just fixed them no absolutely we need to get um cannabis passed um not only for health reasons uh but also taxes so you know if we tax it i mean i i want to utilize that tax money and put it towards first responders uh you know we could create a texas border patrol we could help uh um, get new equipment or updated equipment for our first responders across the uh, across the state. But as far as the health portion, um, absolutely. You know, I've talked to a lot of people who do use it, and um, 
I've, I've heard nothing but good things. I've, I've looked into it, uh, done some reading on it myself. Um, you know, we already have CBD oil that's, that's here. It's approved. But um, if we're going to do it, we need to go all the way. Now, the only issue is, is if we do that, uh, the feds are not going to uh, let those folks open up a bank account yet. So what do we do? And that is something that I have talked to multiple people on any idea of, of creating a system, uh, especially for that. And uh, we ha haven't come up with that yet, but we will. Are you talking about the, uh, the, 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 the purveyors, uh, the, the entrepreneurs that would set up like dispensaries that Correct. would provide? Um, yeah, I, I don't know what kind of a system that Oklahoma has, but uh, I know that Oklahoma has uh, a lot of marijuana dispensaries around there. I know that Colorado, they've got a recreational law up there now. Um, so that might be something that we could look at to apply here. Um, but as far as like um, uh, along the lines of, 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 of the medical uh, questions, uh, the latest note, the last numbers the CDC released uh, for Texas was in 2017. And they showed that 11.4% of Texans are diabetic. That number, obviously, it's going to flex uh, either way because the numbers are four years old now. But um, where, where would you stand? Or where do you stand on Texas Senate Bill 827? Uh, what that is, is a, it puts a cap of $25 a month or per month for insulin. Um, where do you stand on that? Because um, we know that, it, you know, we know that uh, there was an executive order signed by, by uh, Joe Biden that basically eliminated uh, the rule that Trump put into place when he took office that put a cap nationally on what pharmaceutical companies can charge. Uh, but as soon as President Biden took office, that that number tripled basically overnight. Um, uh, I, I know that I, I know a lot of people personally that are diabetic, just like everybody else. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people as well. Uh, you know, th this is a life saving drug. This is this is something that's essential for the quality of life. And I, I just I find it borderline. Personally, I find it borderline criminal, you know, that that pharmaceutical yeah, I, companies I can charge as much as they do. I completely agree with you. You know, anybody that is not willing to serve then our criminal or whatever uh, we can get them with. But, um, you know, we're Texans, Ohomans, wh whoever you are, um, you know, we're, we're average people. And we need to help each other. We need to help get past certain things in our life. And, you know, if we need to do whatever we can to, to keep the price down on insulin uh, for these folks to survive, then, my golly, we need to do whatever we can. And if that means coming up uh, with a uh, some kind of a Texas uh, health system, you know, I know we have uh, uh, JPS and, and so forth, but... Uh, if we come up with our own health system, I think, you know, maybe we can do, do some good on that. Okay. So at the beginning of our interview, uh, the beginning of the show, I told you that I wasn't going to give you a softball question and well, the Democrats get, they get all kinds of, of softball questions. So I'm going to give you one. So I hope you're ready for it. All right. So just make sure you're good, good, good and solid in the batter's box. Cause I expect you to hit this one. Well, out of the if, park. if not, we might have communication problems. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. But uh, what, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? French vanilla. See, it's okay. That, yeah. That's a safe answer. Now, uh, when we actually first met, we we have had, we've actually uh, uh, for everybody else, we have actually met you. We met you at the barbecue uh, fest. How how good was that barbecue? Because Johnny said some of it was really, 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 really good to the where it changed his religion. It reinforced yeah, my faith in God. Some of it was that? good. No, some of it was really good. Uh, some of it was dry too. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. That was a that was a thing I kept on telling because uh, me and my brother in law, uh, me I'm actually a chef. Uh, come around, I just haven't cooked at a restaurant in a while, but you know the the stuff still sticks with me and everything. 
And a lot of the people out there, they were using uh, aluminum foil. And an actual person that actually does like brisket and everything, you don't use aluminum foil. What you do is you use uh, butcher paper, and they're not using butcher paper. That's the reason why a lot of them were dry. Huh. Well, I'm not a... Uh... It's all about that temp, though. Once that temp stalls, you got to crutch it by wrapping it in the butcher paper, and then you can wrap it with some towels and stick in a cooler for a couple of hours, a dry cooler, just to let it rest. That's the key right there. Yeah. Good brisket needs to rest. I don't care who you are. Well, that's, me that's any kind of uh, beef meat. Even yeah. even your steaks, you let, uh, you well, let yeah. off the – after you get done cooking and everything – you uh, let and it off. Ribs on a Texas thing per se. You got to let ribs. You got to crutch ribs too. If that's all there is to it. Yeah, like, okay. oh, that know, would be a my, great question. My steaks. My, my steaks. I put in a Ziploc bag. In Ziploc bag. Bag. You broke up horribly. Yeah, see? Yeah. Communication problems. So, he called so, it right there. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah can I can hear you now. Yeah. All right. So so with my steaks. <laughs> Every time he gets to the steak part, it doesn't want to work. And then I put a Ziploc bag. Oh, so I put the steak in a Ziploc bag, and I fill the Ziploc bag with uh, Italian dressing, and I let it sit over. Yeah, that's a... Yeah, I've I've done that with uh, like ranch and stuff like that. It, you get the flavor and everything. I've done it with like whiskey. I've done it with beer. I mean, I, mean, I you, just don't like like. I keep it get simple. The taste you got to have good marbling, salt and pepper, five minutes on each side. Grill marks, dude. Just saying. Well, I've, had, I've had, the, I had this stuff that's uh, <laughs> it's like uh, uh, garlic and butter. Well, that's after the fact. I'm talking about while you're cooking. If you, unless you want to get all Gordon Ramsay about it, and then you cook everything in a pan, <laughs> and then you put butter and a little bit of thyme, and you're sitting there with a spoon. No, that's just just stop. Don't forget to baste it with uh, rosemary leaves or branches hey, and uh, everything. Hey guys, I want to mention two other things too. Okay. Uh, you know, I have to. I got to mention my book. Uh, the first three months in life after deployment, it's about uh, me and my air crew, my reserve air crew on a C-130 flying over in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, that's out on Amazon and about 32,000 other entities out there. And you said it's called uh, the, the first three months? I'm going to mention the first three months in life after deployment. It's You'll see it when you Google it on Amazon. Um, it's an air crew standing next to a C-130. And that picture was actually taken in Afghanistan. Okay. Okay. And then, and then the other thing is, is I want to mention uh, our veterans organization, uh, Veterans of Operation Iraqi Enduring Freedom, or the short version is VOIF, V O I E F, uh, V O I E F dot org. So uh, we're putting everything together. We're revitalizing that. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, no problem. Uh, just just uh, text me the links to those stuff. And I'll put it in the description of the video. I will. I will. So, uh, you have the dubious honor, or maybe, I don't know, dubious would be the right word. You've yeah. basically served as guinea pig because you are our first political interview on this show. So, yeah. Right on. So, and um, a better. Yeah. And a better so, but, uh, you know, we did one for the team. <laughs> well you know when we signed up i mean we signed up to be guinea pigs anyway so it doesn't matter uh so you're you're just you're just keeping the standard that's all you're doing oh yeah uh, i got oh, i got thanks. one I, I i totally blanked out and i freaking reviewed this today so i can actually uh ask this question and get your uh opinion on it how do you got your opinion on uh uh adam west uh throwing his hat into the governorship for texas yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. colonel allen west yeah you know i as say. A- a veteran I have uh, but as I told uh, somebody else in another interview I'm not a comedian I'm not a car salesman and I'm not somebody that used his prior office as a stepping stone to try to do something on a personal note just as a vendetta um, you know I Adam, uh, Alan West is still 
a career politician, uh, no matter how you look at it. Um, and that's one thing I am not. I am not a career politician. I just jumped in with both feet. You know, I seen things that were going awry. And, uh, you know, I was always taught you can't complain unless you try to fix it. So uh, I am trying to use my uh, military knowledge, my military skills um, as a non-career politician to move forward and, and try to help the folks here in Texas. Okay. Outstanding. Well, uh, we, we, we definitely appreciate your time today. And uh, we'll, we'll give you the last parting shot. Yeah, tell us, everybody, where you can get reached at. Uh, you can reach me at my website at kurtschwab.com, um, or my email is kurt, K-U-R-T, at kurtschwab.com. So it's pretty simple. Okay. Right. Well, and Kurt, thanks a lot for your time again. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to uh, you know to sit down with us through all of the, uh, the hiccups and the glitches. And so, but uh, yeah, we appreciate it. All right. Thanks, buddy. Great. Thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate it. All right. No problem. Take care. Thank you.